Bonjour à tous. Bonjour à tous. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's 1 p.m. French time. It's great to see those of you who are already connected for this ninth session of our cycle on solidarity, which started in March uh, earlier this year, working in partnership with our colleague, our Finnish, Greek, uh, Simuzet and Israeli uh, partners and friends. As you will know, if you've been following us, this cycle uh, was initiated as part of a call for projects from ICOM International, focusing on solidarity between museums during the uh, COVID crisis. Our idea, the thing that we're trying to do together, is to discuss and share together in a very free and spontaneous way about the situation of museums around the world. There are people who connect in from different parts of the world, uh, often really from the four corners of the earth. And we all have a lot to share, a lot of things to say about the crisis we've been walking through over the last 18 months. And if we believe uh, the experts who are often talking to us, unfortunately, it might not be entirely behind us. In any case, in Europe, we are in a, a period of remission, we could call it. Most museums are open uh, and life is little by little starting to get back to some semblance of normality. The interesting thing for us will be to think about the things that during our long months of closure, of fear, of losses, uh, loss of contact with our public audiences, loss of finance, what things have changed, what things have had to change, how have our museums organized themselves to get through the crisis? There'll be some questions that we'll ask at another time uh, in order to get into more detail of that question. But today we are together a few days after the publication of a third report by ICOM International on the situation of museums in the face of the pandemic. The report, which can be downloaded, uh, I, I'm showing it on the screen now, if you can see it, and I'll try and put the link in the chat box if you want to download it later on. It's a, a gold mine of information, as ICOM has been throughout this uh, pandemic. I do want to encourage you to look at the, the report. Today's session uh, focuses on the link with our audiences and particularly our link with remote audiences, distant audiences. If I look at the results in the ICOM report, I can see that with respect to new forms of museum and research practice, uh, particularly focusing on improving access for audiences, you will see that uh, museums have considerably enhanced their digital uh, offerings, particularly uh, in many cases without any additional financial resources to fund that. So this has been a significant leap uh, forward and we might need to think about how that has been possible financially. The uh, report talks about some of the museums that have tried to enhance accessibility uh, over this time. We can see there are many, many museums which have tried to focus on mobilizing themselves during the pandemic and to even make the most of the closures in order to improve accessibility. So more than 50% of museums are making a specific effort in this area. So 
why did we ask this question? Right in the middle of the pandemic in January and February earlier this year, we were wondering whether this radical change in our relationship with audiences when museums were closed, but at the same time, audiences were able to access a very much enhanced offer from home, from their uh, computers. We wondered whether that would m change the structure of our audience. We're obviously always trying to look at the positive aspects, even amongst the terrible impact of the, the, the pandemic. We wanted to ask the question, because museums have reached out to their audiences, uh, because there have been some real challenges, uh, physical difficulties when museums are far away from their audiences, when there are challenges around mobility and physical accessibility, or when museums are perceived uh, by some audiences to be a too intimidating place. So they uh, experience a kind of social barrier. Has the fact of reaching out to our audiences via digital technology in their own homes, has this had a positive effect? Has this been something that uh, museums have succeeded in working with? And if so, how can we consolidate the and strengthen the positive effects that we might have been uh, able to put in place in our relationship with our audience. So that's going to be the focus of today's discussion. And I'm going to already thank all of you who have agreed to talk about this subject this afternoon. It's a, an important subject, a sensitive and, and, and tricky subject. We, we don't necessarily have all the answers to this question, but your experiences uh, as uh, museum professionals and your ex experience as, as participants and as an audience of, in this meeting, uh, there's more than 50 of us uh, gathered here, uh, and particularly uh, with the focus on solidarity, uh, working together, uh, which has been the focus of our cycle, being able to work together better than we did uh, before the COVID crisis. Uh, so we're going to do, discuss this question. We have uh, five, maybe six uh, speakers in, in reality from different uh, areas of the world. We're going to start with with two uh, French speakers from Paris. And apologies uh, for, for those of you who are elsewhere. But we're going to have uh, uh, the Deputy Director of Audiences and the Head of Marketing at the Pompidou Centre in Paris. Then we're going to hand over to Tanya Valiscu. Uh, I am not sure if she's with us. I didn't see her earlier on, um, who is the curator at the Museum of Greek Costume History in Athens. Thank you very much to our Greek colleague for being here with us. Following on from that, we're going to uh, hand over to Marie-Laure Estigna, who is director of the uh, Arts et Métiers Museum in Paris. After that, we're going to hand over to Beata Reifenscheid, who is director of the Ludwig Museum in Koblenz in uh, Germany. She's also the chair of ICOM Germany. So it's very uh, interesting for us to be able to hear from uh, my counterpart as chair of ICOM Germany, because we know that Germany has uh, done a lot. Uh, they've held a lot of muse museum meetings throughout the uh, COVID crisis. After that, we'll talk about talk here from uh, Lina Sipanen, who's in charge of the photographic archives of the Espo City Museum in Finland. Thank you, Lina, for being with us today. I do want to take uh, the opportunity to greet our uh, Israeli friend who is a co-organizer of this session. I don't know if uh, Shaquille Ahmani is going to be with us. I know he had another meeting at the same time uh, with uh, science and technology museums. If he's not with us uh, this afternoon, uh, he might listen to the meeting later. So without further ado, 
I do think that all of our um, speakers are around the table uh, virtually. I'm going to start by handing over to Selma and uh, Aurélie. Selma toprak is Deputy Director of Audiences at the uh, Pompidou Centre in Paris. Aurélie Jourde is Head of Marketing again at the Pompidou Centre and they're going to uh, tell us based on their experience over the last period uh, what have you found out about the audiences that came back into the museum when you reopened or those that have uh, got in contact with you uh, via uh, social networks and internet when you've continued to put in place a, a significant digital offering selma and aurelie over to you uh, you've got maybe about 10 minutes or so uh, uh, each of you could speak for around 10 minutes and that should leave some time for debate and discussion uh, please uh, if you're listening in use the, the the chat box if you want to ask any questions or if you want to share any uh, additional information it's really useful for 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 all of us to to see that sorry uh, selma and Aurélie, uh, <laughs> i'm taking up a bit of your time just to highlight that our discussions are recorded traditionally we say that because you have agreed to take part in a recorded discussion uh assumes that you are okay with being uh, filmed and recorded um so i just wanted to highlight that the second thing i wanted to say was to think thank our interpreters who are working in english and in spanish who who've been with us uh, throughout our sessions so over to you selma and aurelie yes uh, good afternoon i hope you can see me all right my image is frozen here but i think you can hear me yes we can we can hear you excellent thank you so before starting to look forward perhaps we could look back at what we did at the pompidou center during the crisis and um, we decided to speak together with aurelie in this session partly because we have a complementary role uh, within the Pompidou Centre and also because I recently joined the Pompidou Centre and I wasn't there in, in the first, everything that was put in place in the first lockdown. But what can I can say is that the desire of the Pompidou Centre staff um, from the audiences department, but all the different departments, uh, the museum department, the collections department, their desire to imagine ways of connecting with audiences in a in a strong way is linked to our desire to continue our job and also for everyone to play their part in this health crisis um, and as part of our public service role continue to offer a cultural and artistic uh, offering and to show solidarity for the audiences and this is important uh, for the whole of our institution after uh, well, in Aurélie's presentation we'll talk about the reality of these different systems uh, whether they were remote or outside of the the center um, which were accelerated and encouraged by lockdown that's helped us to think uh, about new ways new approaches but i'm going to pass over to aurelie now so i'm going to talk to you a bit about the what we put in place during these two lockdowns as salma said we first of all um, had an industrialization or amplification role things that we were already doing perhaps on a very small scale we increased the rhythm of these things so for example of workshops of various workshops where well, we had uh, com conference speakers um, we had um, volunteers even in the first lockdown who who, who got involved in this and then we also put things online pompidou center in the classroom um, using this online system and this 
um, enabled our speakers to move around the Ile de France and go into classrooms um, using uh, uh, PowerPoint uh, directly with students, school pupils. This, this uh, Pompidou Centre in the classroom approach was put in place in the second lockdown. But what we've seen is that this system is ongoing now because a number of teachers, although we, we've had a good feedback um, from pupils since reopening in the month of May, we have some institutions who really have enjoyed this concept and are still a bit hesitant with school outings. And so they're, they're drawing on Pompidou in the classroom. But this is something that will probably stop in September. So I'm talking here about amplification, industrialization of things that we're already doing and the professionalization of things that existed already. And then there was an innovation system in order to, to touch certain audiences. Um, one innovation which was very successful was a, an art call where um, speakers called on the telephone, uh, priority vulnerable audiences um, to talk to them about uh, particular works of art. And this was really very successful because not everyone is very um, uh, at ease with uh, IT, with the internet. So just using the good old telephone to develop uh, connections and offer remote services in this way. I'd also just like to talk quickly about two tests that we did during this period, um, focused on remote tours, um, which a number of institutions have developed. We tried two things. First of all, a, a live um, event using Microsoft Teams in the exhibition halls. Um, and it was for school pupils in particular. And the second thing we did was that semi-live tours, the the conference speaker uh, was static and then presented a PowerPoint that was uh, shown within the classroom. And this is something we tested that we know that we can do, but we haven't really chosen to continue down that road because there are a number of uh, disadvantages as well, which I can explain more later if you have questions about that. So I'll pass back now to Selma. Yes, we managed to test these systems, but now the challenge is to get audiences back to the institution or, and to continue to uh, reach uh, audiences that are further away and aren't coming back yet. So we're thinking about hybrid systems now. And we're trying to redevelop the educational teams approach. We're trying to produce a, a kind of box um, that allows teachers to work on teaching tools that they can use in their classrooms uh, based on works in our collections, um, which also provide uh, tools for art, art workshops and draws connections between the institution and organizing invitations for students to come in to the institution. So the idea is that this could be used by classes that are too far away to come and visit, but it also could be used by classes that are closer. And we want to continue to develop this relationship with the institution. So the real focus for us, we'd, we'd really love to hear from our colleagues here because we're really thinking about this hybrid approach, um, the link between remote uh, presentations and also presentations outside of the institution. There's really all we've got, what I've got to add. Aurélie says, I think I, I've read a question from uh, Melbourne. I don't know if we can answer that question now or shall we carry on? Juliet says, no, it's it's really up to you, really. I think it would be good first perhaps to hear the presentations and then we could come back to the different questions depending on the questions presented in the chat. But you're, if you want to speak on it now, um, that's okay. But I'd rather 
we passed on to our, our other speakers now, if that's okay, and we can debate and discuss later on. Yes, that's absolutely fine. Let's do it that way. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentations. I've, I will come back to this in the discussion. This, your original form. This is the first time that I've heard um, talk of of, of organ of, of calls, telephone calls. Um, with remote audiences, that would be something interesting to hear if other people here have had other kinds of original and innovative practices. Can't say that the telephone is particularly innovative in some ways, but using it in this way is innovative. So now I'm going to pass over to Tanya Velisku, who is our colleague from Greece. I think Tanya is with us. Can I see Tanya? Yes. Hello. Do you hear me? Voilà, bonjour, bonjour, uh, Tania, vous êtes conservatrice au musée uh, de l'histoire du, du costume, uh, du costume grec à, à Athènes. Uh, Est-ce que je, je peux vous passer uh, maintenant? Tania, you are uh, the uh, curator at the Museum of Greek Costume History in Athens. Uh, I'd be really interested to hear about how your small museum has been able to uh, increase uh, your audience, uh, I think that's what's happened during this uh, pandemic. What new links have you uh, developed with your audience? Uh, good morning to everyone. I'm so glad for being invited to attend this meeting as a representative of the Museum of the Greek Costume and share some experiences with you regarding COVID-19 and the museum. Uh, the museum is, uh, as you said, is a small costume museum situated in Athens, and uh, it holds a collection of Greek regional costumes from the 19th and 20th century. Uh, let's share a PowerPoint at the moment. Can I, can I share a screen, please? Because it's not allowed, okay? C'est bon normalement. Okay. Okay. Uh, in today's meeting, we will focus on curatorial practices employed in uh, the digital exhibition 1821-2021, A Thousand Stories Stitched on a Piece of Cloth and the development uh, of the museum's online content. The exhibition was organized to mark the bicentennial of the Greek War of Independence. It is uh, structured around 12 uh, units, each one developed through videos of contemporary visual artists. The units, available at 1821.lkonelnido.com, shape the overall exhibition narrative and form a serial streaming exhibition having the garment as its reference point. In particular, the exhibition features valuable and unique exhibits from regions that played a key role in the 1821 revolution, rare objects of the Philhellenic fashion, as well as garments from the post-revolution period. The perception of dress object as non-stable and ever-changing is further extending through contemporary artistic reconstructions of the clothes of the revolution era. The exhibition was one of the museum's initiatives during the coronavirus pandemic, aiming to first become more accessible to distant audiences, to combine the physical space and digital world, Three, continue supporting access to cultural heritage. And four, build new relationships between contemporary artists and the folk museum. The exhibition was prepared before a lockdown was enforced to be presented in the museum's own space. It was planned to open in March 2021, coinciding with the celebrations for the 200 years from the Greek War of Independence. At the time, we could, uh, we could not even imagine the unprecedented situation COVID-19 pandemic would bring and the impact it would have on museums. 
Since March 2020, museums in Greece have remained closed in line with government restrictions for almost a whole year. There was a short break during summer 2020 with a limited number of visitors at the time allowed to entry. Facing the crisis, the museum had to either postpone the exhibition and wait until museums reopen or prepare to transfer the whole exhibition online. We opted to translate the exhibition content into the online sphere, hoping that in this way we would keep in touch with the public. However, several questions were raised regarding how digital content is conceptualized and presented since online exhibition content had not previously been employed by the museum. And uh, further analysis was conducted regarding what sort of content should be presented and how online visitors could become engaged in the exhibition. In a museum uh, titled the Museum of the History of the Greek Costume, a collection of historical costumes and perhaps some ornaments and archives would be the first thing to spring to mind. However, the museum uh, showed keenness to escape cliche ideas of an outmoded exhibition limited to demonstrating uh, costume variants. Instead, the exhibit utilized alternative conceptual approaches through contemporary video works aiming to fulfill the need for visual meaning making within a museum. 12 videos in total were produced to conjure the narratives, all streamed on the website 1821.lkionlidon.com, starting from February 5th, 2021. Uh, from that time, a new video was uploaded every Friday at 1821, as 1821 was the key year of the outbreak of the Greek War of Independence. The videos were either short documentaries or videos providing a more conceptual vision to the themes. By creating video artworks for, uh, for each unit, we expected the video artists to, uh, to take an active role in meaning making within the museum, and the whole process would therefore become a collaboration of everyone involved, rather than strictly following the curator's vision. In the photo gallery, the visitor could click on each photo to explore more on the featured garments. Uh, overall, there were three components to its unit, the material, the textual and the visual, all bound to support uh, each other. One uh, clear positive uh, uh, aspect of the online exhibition is the easiest uh, access to audiences who would not otherwise be able to attend. It was an opportunity to reach a wider global audience, since for the first time the ICOM's Costume Committee, the Costume Society in the UK and many Greek embassies worldwide, shared our exhibition in their Facebook, uh, in their web and, the, and social media pages. However, the problem is how do we create interaction between viewers and exhibits without physical space? To achieve this, all videos uploaded in the museum web page were immediately searched through the museum's Facebook page and YouTube channel, taking advantage of the easy interaction social media offers nowadays. Um, as, as it was mentioned, the physical exhibition was our main intention prior to lockdown. So we decided that the digital uh, uh, exhibition model would provide some sense of physicality to the exhibition. Therefore, uh, two of the 12 thematic units are presented in the museum space. They are based on the idea of pocket museums, which contains information and narratives into a limited space. For example, the installation view of the digital exhibition 1821 square meters, the war in the salons, uh, summarizes basic aspects of the first Hellenic trend. The exhibit is also accompanied uh, by a video projection. If you visit the physical uh, exhibitions to see the exhibits up close and scan the QR codes you meet uh, here, uh, the corresponding information given in the exhibition's website will be available on your device. Simil similarly, the other physical exhibition, Fustanella or Telecode, directly references the digital through QRs uh, once again, 
while the online visitor is provided with a physical image of the, of the exhibition. Overall, a thousand uh, stories uh, stitched on a piece of cloth was an ambitious attempt on behalf of the museum to enter new territory and uh, present an online exhibition that would offer a refreshing uh, alternative uh, form uh, from usual costume display. Uh, however, not only did the museum continue to serve its audiences during the pandemic, but it also managed to reach remote audiences during a period when human connections were limited. Uh, thank you so much. I don't know if we have time uh, to, to, to share with you a few seconds of, uh, of a video just to get uh, an idea of uh, what we are talking about. <coughs> oui, c'est une question qui me posée. Merci de me le dire. Uh, Est-ce qu'on a cette vidéo? On peut la passer ou on la passe? Do you have the Do you have the video to show us now? Yes, mm -hmm. just a moment. I share the screen. D'accord. Alors peut-être on la passera plutôt à la fin. If you're okay, Tanya, can we show it at the end? Okay. Yes. 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 Of course. Okay, on la passe. D'accord, on la passe à la fin. OK, we'll show, it at, we'll show it at the end. Thank you so much, uh, Tanya. We won't forget to, to show it at the end of the, the discussion. You're welcome. I can see that our co colleague Beate Reifenscheid from the Ludwig uh, Museum in Koblenz, uh, she is uh, saying that she won't be able to stay with us for the whole uh, time of the meeting because she has to join another meeting. Uh, would Marie-Laure Estigna agree to let us uh, hear from uh, Beata first? Uh, is that okay with you, Marie-Laure? No problem, says Marie-Laure. Okay. So, Beata, I'm going to hand over to you now so you can speak to us. Yeah, that, that's really super. Thank you so much. First of all, I had a lot of problems to have the Wi-Fi with my not, uh, regular computer, so I'm just doing it with my mobile, which I really don't like because it's really more difficult to handle. But on the other hand, it shows uh, the normal difficulties we even have with uh, technical uh, sources. So um, I was more or less thinking what, what had happened during the pandemic uh, last year and uh, what's happening this year. So I'm speaking briefly about the situation uh, especially of course in Germany and I hope it's uh, it's a nice input for you it's not it's not really focused on my museum here uh, which I could if you want could I could add a little bit so um, to reflect a little bit last year the pandemic just uh, I think blow us away uh, for closing the museums and uh, why we were doing so we were I think the first time ever really considering what, what is our task? What, is our, what are our, our essential tasks for the audience, for the public? Because uh, we realized that having a museum or running a museum is not for us only. It's really for public and for, for an audience, even though if, if it's only a private collection, even those, uh, those private collections thrive for, for an audience. Uh, so how to reach an audience without being able to open the doors? Uh, and of course, the first uh, movement, the first uh, development to consider that was to uh, enlarge the access via uh, digital tools. But uh, most of us, um, I hope it's not, not too bad to say so, but most of us weren't, weren't prepared, weren't really uh, well prepared. I'm not talking about the major museums who were developing this uh, for already uh, quite, quite a long time. So in Germany, we have been very happy that uh, our, our Minister of Culture, Monica Grütters, uh, enabled us in improving our digital tools by in, uh, installing this program, which she called Neustart. It's like a new beginning uh, for, especially for the digital uh, access of museums. And that was called uh, Museum 4.0 
which gave all museums the uh, possibility to apply for a special amount of money. It could be like 10,000 euro, but could be even 200,000 euro. So it depends on, on the project, depends on the range, range of the museum and so forth. So uh, many museums uh, took the advantage and the chance to, to ask for this kind of support and this money. Uh, even us, we, we applied for this money and uh, we received that. So th this was really uh, one major step. It was having the opportunity with some financial tools, uh, then establish, establishing programs, for example, virtual tours or audio guides or uh, even, even new databases and so forth. Um, which means that many museums in the meantime really uh, enlarged their range and were able to, uh, yeah, to, to play and to explore what is possible with the audience. Um, and this has been uh, quite successful for many of us, for many museums. I, I was talking with a lot of um, museum uh, curators, directors who were, um, were quite pleased. I wouldn't say that it's that it's the total solution uh, in gaining a lot of audience because if you didn't had an audience before, it's quite a challenge to reach an audience uh, when you haven't had any like very good website or social media and so forth. So from just from the stretch to um, engage an audience is uh, is also very very difficult. So in the meantime, I would say um, it was improving the digital tools. Uh, it was improving uh, after opening uh, this year, mostly this year also was summer, some weeks, but I would say this year during late spring, we were now uh, all opening the museums. It is more easy for us to uh, engage a physical audience, but also a, a hybrid audience, which, which we just heard, like having these digital tours, but also having maybe uh, what we do, uh, digital tours, but we are, in, we are reachable via live stream to talk uh, with the curators uh, within the tours. Um, but this does not really mean that this is the end already. Um, the end is to really to reflect what is the position of the museums in our societies? How can we um, overcome the crisis? And I really, I'm still very scared about what will happen at the end of the year when the budgets will be uh, displayed. Uh, and I think there will be a lot of cuts, uh, which um, most of us do not like to talk about, but there will be a long period of cutting down the budgets uh, and also forcing us to go more, more digital. Um, but, but the main problem will be to, to, to attract the audience with the right tools, with the right uh, impact, with the right uh, attraction to uh, really reach the young people, but also the elder people who are, who are not that much um, skilled to to work with with all all these kind of digital tools so it has to be quite simple to to get uh, into the museums uh, via digital tools but um, still the main focus should be on our side to attract the the, the regular of uh, the regular public uh, to join the museums and this is really quite difficult because uh, till now there are a lot of restrictions so um, the question is, what is, what is really um, the relevance of our museums? Um, there are a lot of discussions about the relevance nowadays. Um, and I think this, this, is, this is really a question which has to be raised, uh, but has to be answered positively, because I'm really very much convinced that museums are more important than ever. Uh, they are places to talk with the societies and also the possibility to go globally um, and especially with also with the digital tools it's more easy to go globally so this is briefly what i would like to say and i don't know whether the line is still online i just see only me can you still hear me juliet 
Yes, we can hear. Ah, yes. Ah, très bien, Beata. Merci beaucoup. Yes, I can uh, hear you very well, Beata. <laughs> Thank you very much, Beata. Yes, you're welcome. Are there any questions? On va jusqu'à quand, jusqu'à quand, Beate, vous pouvez rester avec nous. Beate, how long can you be with us till in this I'm, in this I'm very discussion? sorry, it's very bad. Only five minutes. <laughs> it's really too bad, but it's a it's an official conference which I have to join. So um, I'm sorry. Seems seems to be unpolite. Uh, non, non, mais on va on va donc uh, s'éloigner de. No, de... no problem. Well, then... We're going to break our rule then, and if there's any questions specifically for Beata now, I suggest that we ask them now so that Beata can respond now. I don't know if we have many other German colleagues with us. I know that we had Stephanie Winzig, who was here, and perhaps she could say something about the German situation. But while we wait for questions in the chat, do raise your hand if you want to ask a question. Thank you, Beata, for what you've said, which sets out some important things. You're saying, talking about the, the important role of the government who helped museums, German museums, to develop a digital strategy. I think that's something that ICOM in its survey really underlines. the importance of public policies to support museums and this is the subject of our annual debate on our professional day at the end of September we've given it the title which what cultural policy do museums need I hope that you'll be able to follow this debate because this is the question we're asking today Beata has talked about her fear we can see what's been done positively and how museums have used the resources that have been made available to them but the future is very uncertain and i i think you've underlined this uh, very clearly in a in a big country like germany that there's a lot of questions and so what about countries that not, have not had so, that kind of support from their states and from their governments so that makes me just, uh, I'm just waiting for any questions in the chat. Um, but what this underlines is that when we look in the, in the African countries, the, the digital divide is really massive. 5% of museums in Africa are connected to the internet. Whereas in Europe, North America, uh, all of us are highly connected and this is something we really need to think about think about how we're going to stay united and how we're going to be able to act for our unity knowing that these divides have actually increased whether we want it or or not actually so I think this is a really important subject that you've shared with us. Thank you very much. I'm just trying to have a look in the chat. Um, you can you can see Beata. Can you see the questions in the chat? Um, well, I wasn't. Uh, I, I sometimes I can. Uh, I, I'm a little bit scared that I'm losing the connection. So if if you just uh, raise one one or two questions, which are important, because I don't want to. Be thrown out, <laughs> Juliet. Maybe you can you can transfer one or two questions. D'accord. Mm -hmm. On va on va on va avancer et puis je je vous les transférer mm -hmm. uh, au, au fur et à mesure. Je vais passer ma. Okay. Uh, well, actually, I think we're going to move on, and mm -hmm. I will send you some questions later. So I'm going to. Mm -hmm pass on now to Marie-Laure Estignard, who's just arrived from the United States, so she may be very tired. Thank you very much, Marie-Laure, for being with us and taking part in this discussion today. I think it was really important that you were here today because uh, the French Museum of the Art and Métier, Arts and Crafts is a really 
Yeah, a museum that's only just opened a little bit later than reopened, just a bit later than some of the other ones. And I think we can say that during the pandemic, your museum has been really on the cutting edge and very inventive in terms of audience engagement and particularly in terms of your target audiences. And I think it's really important for all the museums here. I think there's been a really well-developed offering that's been well thought through and well structured, particularly for school pupils. And I think you're going to talk um, primarily about that now. So Marie-Laure is going to talk about the in the, the maintenance and increase in increase of contact with remote audiences. I'm really looking forward to hearing you. Over to you, Marilor. I'm afraid I'm not I'm not hearing Marilor this year. No, we haven't got any sound from Marilor. No, we still can't hear Marie-Laure. I'm really sorry, we're not hearing Marie-Laure right now. Can you speak, uh, Marie-Laure? No, still no sound from Marie-Laure. I think we've got a technical issue at Marie-Laure's end. There's a problem with her microphone, clearly. Do you have... Uh, do you have a microphone plugged into your computer? I think it's uh, looking a bit tricky for Marie-Laure to speak to us. So my suggestion uh, is that we perhaps postpone Mary Law's speech and that we hand over instead to Alina Sibonon who is uh, in charge of photographs and photographic archives at the Espo City Museum in Finland. Okay. Is Lina with us? Are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, I think. Great, great. Lena, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can I share the screen, please? Can I share the screen, please? I have a few slides to show you. Okay, you can share now. All right. And you can see my show here, right? because I can't see you at the moment anymore. Um, no, we can't see your slides right no? now. Okay. Not yet, no. Let's see. Share screen and here. How about now? Yes, we can see them. Okay, and is it in this kind of a... Um... You've not got the slideshow activated yet. Yeah, okay. So. Now it should be. Yes, that's good. All right. So, hello everybody. I'm Lena. Et Marie-Laure pour lui demander de se déconnecter, de se reconnecter pour voir si c'est mieux. Sorry, that was just some instructions to Marie-Laure. Okay. Donc je vais. Just let me know. Okay. Lena, you can go. You can go, uh, Lena. Yes, you can go. All right. So, hello. My name is Lena Sipponen. I'm from Finland, and I'm in charge of the image archives of Espoo City Museum. And nice to see you all here. So, I'm here to tell you about boosting our digital collections during lockdown and reaching out to audiences who are hungry for local history. When the museums closed, we moved into digital services. And because the face-to-face -face meetings with the audience stopped, we wanted to create virtual interaction with them. 
And what is kind of a problem in many digital services is that the users remain anonymous and we still wanted to be able to come across our customers. I'll tell you really briefly about our museum and its mission. So we consist of five museums, the main venue Kamu for varying exhibitions. Then we have a farmhouse museum Glimpse, an archipelago museum in Pentala, a school museum Lagstad and a villa museum Rullud. And we have a wide collections and a unit for cultural environment work. And Espoo is the second biggest city in Finland with a diverse suburban character. It's located right next to the capital city, Helsinki. And Espoo has five bigger community centers instead of just one. And also wide areas of countryside, archipelago and the forests. And the citizens, they identify themselves to the home neighborhoods instead of being an Espoo citizen. It is important for many people to have roots in Epavara or Tapiola or Nuuksio, which are the names of a few neighborhoods. That's why we as a city museum have to make sure we can serve everyone equally and bring out history of every region. But also we must keep in mind that there's a lot of people moving in all the time from other parts of Finland and also other countries. Telling about and making the history of Espoo we think it's best to do in interaction with the locals, no matter how long they have lived here. So when the lockdown started in March 2020, we decided to invest in our online services, as many museums did. And we, as many others, produced virtual museums and exhibitions, mobile guides to historical sites, virtual lectures, etc. And suddenly, Internet was the place you could visit almost any museum in the world. For us in collection work, the lockdown meant increasing our open digital collection. In Finland, we have this portal called Finna. This is the um, front page of our view in Finna, you can see now. And Finna is the place where museums, archives and libraries can publish their collections. It's an open data source where people can download images with marked usage rights. It has actually a lot of similarities to Europeana. Opening digital museum collections is also provided by the state of Finland. We just got the subvention for digitizing more collections to Finna as did many other Finnish museums. And we got this subvention because of the pandemic loss, but in normal, normal times, it's also possible to apply state funding for digitizing. So our museum has an own new in, in this portal, Finna, where we publish images, items and archive material. And in spring 2020, we made a quick plan of entities, which we would highlight at the front, front page. So last year we published 10 entities showing mostly cultural environment of different regions in Espo. We had a few projects concerning the theme anyway, for example, a few exhibitions we couldn't open, so it was easy to pick subjects for online publishing. According to customer feedback, old photos of their neighborhoods are the hottest stuff in our image collections and it truly reached its audiences. It is possible to collect statistics of the customers in Finna, and it was really pleasant to see the attendance exploding. In 2019, we had had a bit more than 66,000 guests in Finna page, and in 2020, the amount doubled. And there's also a feedback channel in Finna, where people mostly supply or correct the content information of the photos. And that, that is really worthy, but it only gives a hint about the significance of our collections to the audience. Social media is a better source for that. That is a screenshot from our museum's Facebook page. Every time we publish a new entity in Finna, we inform the audience about it in social media, sometimes also in our newsletter. Facebook is our number one communication channel, but we also use Instagram and Twitter. 
Here you can see a post in Facebook from April 2020, when we published thousands of photos of the Housing Federation in Finland. And those photos are mostly about the architectural pearl Tapiola Garden City, which is in the biggest picture. And it was a huge success. In our scale, it reached a record-breaking amount of people. And in Espo, many local communities have their own Facebook groups. And there's also groups for sharing old photos in general. And this so-called Grapevine Espo group, which shares all kinds of locally interesting information from citizens' point of view. And in these groups, our boost to digital collections have been definitely resonated. People share and repost our images and comment fields are full of memories and stories about the place in question. And that is so far the only way we can follow where the published collections go. When we publish something in Finna, we have to be sure that the copyright and the content both allow legal online publishing because after releasing an image, it is fair game and we cannot control what happens to it. Mostly it's only good, like cultural heritage creates more cultural heritage. And this example is from one really active neighborhood Facebook group called Leppavaaran Kansalaismuisti. I'm not translating it, but it's this Leppavaara district's people. And below these photos, the comments make a long cumulating conversation. For us, it is enough though to see that our collections benefit and cheer up the locals during the pandemic and also in the future. We are currently working on our audience engagement policy in which we update our audience groups and also take our online audiences into account. It would be great to have even more interaction with the online audiences and we are thinking about the ways to do so. But to sum up, the contents of Finna have created interaction with museum and its collections, the audiences and local communities. The photos gather a lot of commentation in Finna and they are widely shared and discussed in social media. The historical photos of different parts of the city are very meaningful to many people. And digital services as online exhibitions or virtual guides May, research, may, may reach people worldwide, but by this digital service, we have for sure reached new local audiences and especially increased interaction with them. Thank you. And if you have any questions or comments, I'll be happy to answer. Or my boss, Rita Kela, or colleague, Johanna Vähäpesola, who are supposedly also present. Merci, merci beaucoup de, de, votre, de votre présentation, Léna. On dit bien Léna, j'espère que je prononce bien le, le nom. C'était vraiment intéressant. Il y aura sûrement des, des, des questions à la fin. Je crois. Thank you, Léna. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I, I hope that Marie-Laure has now um, dealt with her sound issues. Can you hear me, says Marie-Laure? Yes, we can hear Marie-Laure. This is good. I'm really sorry, says Marie-Laure. I had to switch to my uh, my telephone because my computer wasn't working. So thank you, Juliette, for handing over to me. I'm going to talk about what we've been doing uh, at the AF in Mitte Museum. We have about 10 cultural mediators. Since they had no more groups to welcome, they had lots of time to innovate and come up with new ideas, and they really they really went for it. I'll I'll put in the in the chat a PowerPoint where you can see a number of links to things that, that we've done. So First of all, what we tried to do is to have a new perspective on our co collections and on their material nature, or rather their non-material nature, which is a bit different for a museum. And because normally museums have a particular relationship with objects, um, so we developed 
systems and ways for maintaining connections with our audiences or the audiences are they our audiences uh, i don't know where they belong to us we also developed new skills um, and we adopted a different tone to come out of the world of strict world of knowledge and approach have a more entertainment approach which is not very easy because when you're working with a museum team uh, not everyone's really into that in a in a museum team and, and you'll see how how far we've we've gone in this um we we developed a website called museum at your home we had exhibitions that were going to open but we were locked down on the opening day so we had uh, activities for children we had a treasure hunt uh, using google street view you could go around the museum with different stages so we did a big treasure hunt in the museum we worked on what was going on behind the scenes on social media and we transformed the the manipulation of organizations and we thought about uh, visitor support um, which we, we since we could not touch anything and everything had to be able to be explained with your um, mobile telephone so we used augmented reality and, and everything used augmented reality we used an alternative universe we imagined a virtual tour of a top top model uh, exhibition which was in the second lockdown which we had a uh, this a street view approach with also a cultural mediator who could do a virtual tour a number of museums did this and now this is something that we is paid is paid for we also worked with schools and um, scientific mediation is very serious which can be something really difficult when it's not fun so we invented the, the quarter of an hour for scientific approach and we explain scientific objects with a humor heuristic approach so we we were talking about we had the uh, milk bottle for example and we linked into a well-known advert asking what this this bottle was or asking what's happened to my socks where, where did my second sock go in the washing machine we also transformed real projects into virtual projects um, we had a class that was working uniquely virtual we did we did uh, virtual workshops with activity leaders and we also managed to do something which we never managed to do we managed to have classes who were outside france when we developed projects with artistic residencies outside of france in africa in asia so this is something that the conf the lockdown has enabled for us we also had new players came who who got in touch with us it was a bit of a bit of luck here really it's it's quite funny really how, how it happened but we were contacted by an influencer there's a website called my better self and she'd written her own bucket list and she had 30 things she wanted to do on her bucket list and one of the things she wanted to do was to spend the night in a museum um, so we went to the museum we slept in the museum it's really not comfortable uh, don't try it we went for a really crazy approach and we we slept in the museum and we reached a number of young uh, young women who were really new to me museums and we had 50,000 views um, in a week or two on YouTube and so we started to think about how can we work with influencers the people who aren't from the museum world and can bring in new people um, because they have expert expertise that we don't have in the same uh, linked into to this we worked with uh, 
another someone else working on YouTube, YouTube, and we were able to bring in concerts from the from the festival. Um, yes, we we all do this kind of thing that you can that that was then um, redistributed on the TV. These concerts took place a long time before the reopening, but you can see now that getting drawing in new people develops audiences that we don't know that are actually a long way outside of the world of museums. So the question now is who are these new audiences? Who are these remote audiences? There are three categories, people that have been made remote because of the health crisis, but will come back to the museum later. People who are geographically distant from the museum and are able to come for the first time because it was closed. These are foreign audiences. And then there are also audiences who are not into museums, who have encountered museums by chance. Um, there are a number of questions here that remain is how can we help these new audiences become loyal to museums and how can we get to know them? How can we speak to them? They, they come, but they're fairly anonymous. Second point is what is the business model that we should use for these different offerings? Yes, we, we had people paying for tours, paying for workshops, but is this something we should continue to do, especially, and how can we transform the virtual tour into a real experience? Transformation is important because if, if, if doing digital uh, te technologies actually takes our audience as a way and keeps them sitting in their chairs rather than coming, that's not a good thing. Another aspect of course, how can we work with influencers? That is something I think we can really develop. There are people who can draw people into our museums and people who are not native to museums. And then also we need to think about what's the role of the object and the works within these, this new approach. And then what is the role of museums in all of this? Because there is people have looked a lot at documentaries and fiction documentaries on art, art history and museums. How can we maintain our place in this world that has a lot of people uh, who have got a, a lot of money have, have come to use the museums? And what is the role of museums in a society that is becoming more digital? What we're doing now is a, a digital approach. Um, experience within the museums. We're developing a support for tours with augmented augmented reality in order to better understand objects. I think if we hadn't had the lockdown, we wouldn't have developed these tools as quickly. We also developed projects outside the museum itself, um, international projects, and also starting with young museum experts. And, and if these projects exist, is, uh, exist, it's because we are working with artists who are able to work with this digital approach, physical and digital. There's only one thing that I'm certain about. It's just my, it's just my opinion, but I'll share it with you. I think we've been locked down and if we succeeded in staying at the heart of our audience's attention, it's because human mediation is the only way that we can actually carry digital mediation. So that is our experience at our museum. We've developed a lot of things, but a lot of questions about who are our audiences, how we're going to get them to come back to museums, and what is the role of museums in a digital world. Thank you very much, Marie-Laure. We're very glad that you got your sound back because it would have been a shame to miss your contribution and the questions that you shared with us, which I think we would all agree uh, with your uh, what you say at the end, that uh, digital mediation depends on human 
mediation. You've talked quite a lot about the fact that you've had a, a number of cultural mediators and how that's been a source of innovation for digital development. And so this is perhaps a question that we're going to ask to all of us because and everyone in the room today, the first question is, we've understood one thing in terms of mediation from the north to the south, Finland to Greece and Germany and French museums. We're still in Europe, but all museums have all have got involved with the digital wave. It didn't take us long to find perhaps what we'd been looking for for some time. Uh, everyone found the keys of digital technologies and the systems for working together were very quickly developed even without new resources. Um, Beata said that German museums got a lot of support with this, but I'm not sure that's the case in all countries. It was a, a great opportunity and an excellent thing, but I think everyone has found the, the digital key um, once again in, in the virtual room. We might have friends from Africa or from Asia. I'm not sure we could necessarily say that with for all parts of the world because there is this digital divide that is really very present and is a question that we need to take into into account when we think about the way that museums form a united community um, in particular through ICOM. But uh, Marie-Laure, you finished by ans asking this question about human mediation. No digital mediation without human mediation is, is what you say. I think that's really very reassuring in terms of all these questions that we're asking. We're asking is uh, digital technology and the ability to access museums from home, is that going to mean that people aren't going to want to travel and to come into the museums and to see collections uh, for real? So this is a question that I'd like us to ask, this question of human mediation and the different experiences that we've shared and perhaps also people in the virtual room with us today. And then I think this is also responding to Beata's invitation. She, she's, she's left, but perhaps uh, others could speak after her. There is this question of the place of museums in a digital world, as Mary Law says but also the place of museums full stop. In France, we were really impacted by clumsy words, which was qualified museums as non-essential services, um, as opposed to shops, etc. And this was uh, almost an offense for us. And this asking this question of, of what the role of museums is in the future world. We, we might not answer that question today, but perhaps some of you may have had an idea of this kind of thing in your own country. So let's uh, go back in, in terms of the order. Human mediation, um, if I go back through our speakers today, uh, uh, we've just had ladies speaking to us today. Um, uh, our ladies are, are very much uh, majority in the museum uh, world. Uh, we're, we're in a. If I ask the question to Selma and Aurélie, what is the place of me human mediation in in your excellent experience and uh, audience research during this period? Perhaps, Aurélie, if you'd like to speak. Yes, uh, well, I would agree uh, with uh, Marie-Laure said, because uh, human mediation is absolutely central. The uh, thing that I presented uh, were very human initiatives. Of course, we use technology, but first and foremost, people were at the heart of what we set up, uh, particularly when we're talking about uh, audiences that are distant from culture or uh, audiences that are affected by disabilities. 
During the lockdown, we had a number of tools that we developed with uh, with Google. We developed a, a, a Kandinsky experience. We had a virtual Miro uh, exhibition. These are uh, some experiments that we uh, carried out during lockdown, which worked really well. But uh, it was something that worked for the traditional museum audience, people who knew about the museums, people who were used to visiting other other other, vis, uh, other museums. If you're trying to reach out to uh, an audience that is not used to visiting uh, museums, that human role, human mediation is really important. Yes, thank you. That's a very important uh, answer. Tanya. Tanya Felisku uh, in Greece, would you be able to give us your opinion on the role of people of human mediation uh, at the Museum of Greek Costume History? Yes, uh, I think it's very important uh, um, because not all of them are um, um, are able to use uh, internet uh, tools or social media tools and uh, we don't want to ignore the, the physical uh, uh, appearance within the museum and the mediation and uh, all the interaction between uh, people. Uh, that's why uh, we, we try to, to develop a, a sort of a digital uh, exhibition models because we we thought that uh, this is very important to 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 uh, to offer a, a sense of uh, uh, physicality within the exhibition and uh, 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 interact with the people and that's why we try to share all the online content content uh, through uh, social media uh, networks because there everybody can share the experiences uh, can put on uh, the impressions can write down the comments or, or uh, and, and, on the, and of course we hope for uh, for sharing everything <laughs> Thank, thank you very much, Tanya. Lena, uh, what about the situation in Finland? Would you be able to answer this question about the, the role of human mediation? Well, I, I'm not sure if I can. It's something that we haven't, or at least I haven't discussed with my colleagues a lot. I think if, if Johanna or Rita are here, they are more able to talk about this but i have been thinking about how how our digital services reach the people with with uh, disabilities to use use um digital devices and i'm really hoping that we can go back to the normal time soon so i can go and show the photos in some school auditoriums for like elderly people and discuss with them face to face but um let's see if my colleagues are here i'm not sure about i'm that. here lena okay see, thanks lena. can you say something <laughs> uh, nice to see you all i'm, I'm rita from yes go uh, ahead rita from finland too from lena's museum i think we haven't thought this point of view so much it was kind of a uh, survive or die situation when the COVID-19 uh, started and the choice to do new digital uh, services for audiences was the only way to reach our audience during the difficult times during the lockdown. I think the right now is the right time to discuss about the balance between human uh, uh, connections and digital digital tools and I don't think that there is a huge kind of gap between them or a lot of dif dif difficulties to get them both work well in museum world but it's it's a really important question and I think we should all think it a lot Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rita. 
for your spontaneous uh, response to this question. In, in your presentations, um, some of you as speakers talked about uh, this rather complicated question that was in the, the title of our session today, which is, uh, did we, through uh, digital technologies, really manage to reach uh, distant audiences? Did we develop a, a new audience, people who uh, weren't in contact with the museum before? Uh, do you have a feeling, any knowledge, or just uh, an intuition, uh, a, a, a sense of whether you were able to reach new audiences who didn't come to the museum before, either because physically they couldn't, or perhaps because uh, they were very intimidated by the idea of going to a museum? Do you have the feeling that you were able to reach these type of remote or distant uh, audiences, uh, that's the kind of expression we use in French. I can see Tanya, who's uh, un unsure, who's a, uh, who, does anyone want to answer this question about whether you've reached a new audience? Uh, have you been able to spot that, work that out? Um, I think uh, uh, we achieved uh, this goal uh, because, for example, Google Analytics uh, gave us uh, an impression that uh, uh, many visitors um, read uh, uh, the online exhibition. And um, furthermore, uh, the, the YouTube channel, uh, which shows them the numbers of uh, views, uh, shows us that uh, foreign uh, uh, foreign visitors uh, um, selected to to view um, most of the videos, and it was for the first time uh, also that um, many foreign uh, uh, organizations uh, shared our uh, our content. So uh, I think it's a it's a way to. Uh, to reach uh, distant uh, audiences and uh, also foreign uh, foreign people that uh, otherwise they can't uh, visit the, the physical uh, the, the, the museum's uh, physical uh, space. Thank you very much, Tanya, uh, for sharing this point of view. Uh, if uh, we don't have further questions, I might talk about uh, the foreign visitors uh, that have got something to say about that. But I just wanted to ask the same question uh, around uh, the, the the virtual room, looking at people that, uh, that I know. I don't know everyone's names, but there's a few people I do know, some French colleagues who might be able to give their point of view. I saw uh, Emily Girard for the Museum in uh, Marseille, Sophie Aran for the uh, Bagnard Museum in Dijon, or uh, the colleagues from the Museum of the Post Office. Have any of you been able to find out or spot whether there are new audiences connecting with your museum? Um, I, I'm addressing my colleagues. I don't know if they want to speak. Hi, Juliette. Uh, I've I'm Emily, uh, Emily Girard. I haven't got a great connection and I can't switch my camera on, but I'm delighted to be with you. So this question of who we reached uh, is not that easy to answer, actually, because in uh, museums like the Museum in Marseille, uh, which I'm part of, we have a number of different departments, which are a bit separate. Uh, we've got a, a conservation department, we've got our audiences department, and we've got a communications department. Oh, Mary Law is saying, I'm sorry, I'm going to speak. Uh, I'm repeating myself a bit. We've, we've all had new um, audiences. That's clear. We must have all had them, but we don't know who they are. And what we don't know is how to communicate with them in the future. We don't know how they arrived, uh, how they they got in, in, in touch with our museums, because we've was there a pest release? Were they part of a network? I think that's the, the challenge today. It's, it's knowing who this 
uh, audiences, this virtual audience, because we are used to uh, doing surveys and studies uh, of our uh, audience and understanding their behaviour within the physical institution. But to answer those questions for a, a new audience, which is a bit anonymous, is a bit more difficult. I think we've all had new audiences. Who, who agrees with what uh, Marie Law says? Do you agree, Emily? Yes, exactly. That was what I was going to say, actually. We're struggling to find exactly who we've reached beyond our traditional uh, audience. Obviously, uh, people who followed what we've done online, a lot of them were people who were used to coming to the museum. Yes, we can, we can hear Emily. Marie Law thought she couldn't hear her. Let me carry on. So, in terms of the uh, collection we did about lockdowns, it, it's, it was our traditional audience. It's people uh, who said to us, thank you, we've not been able to come in to see your exposition, but we want to continue to keep the contact up. So, in this context, uh, it was uh, regular visitors. In other specific uh, activities we've put in place, uh, it's been difficult to get feedback back because a lot of the people who visit uh, are anonymous in this setting. Uh, I guess the data does exist, but uh, in our museum, we haven't been able to really interpret the data and uh, find out whether we've broadened our audience. There's a comment in the chat from Sophie Haran who says, yes, it's very difficult to know uh, who this new uh, audience is. Uh, Sophie agrees with both Marie-Laure and Emily, but she says on some specific keywords on social networks, we're seeing new audience, uh, some who uh, have different interests, which are a bit different to traditional museum subjects. Do you think that we need to uh, set up some new systems to some questionnaires, some surveys to, to start to get to know uh, who this new audience is, where they come from, how they've got in contact with the museum? The question that Marie-Laure is asking uh, and that Emily and Sophie seem to agree with is that uh, the future will be focused on developing the loyalty um, uh, amongst this new audience. I've got a I've got a question and I don't have the answer to it is but it's have we really broadened uh, our audience we're increasing our audience is something that we've always been trying to do and I think that uh, museums have achieved this over a number of years we've got uh, we've got more visitors coming there's no doubt about that but the uh, when people ask what a museum is in society, what's its role in society, what specific role it has in social uh, dialogue, uh, people know about this, but who who are the audiences? And during the pandemic, have we been able to broaden this? Have we been able to reach the audiences that have, uh, have not been in museums before? Have they got on the journey with us? Have they joined us? I, so, uh, I often think of museums that are rather intimidating for some people. I think of people who have disabilities uh, uh, or who can't visit uh, the museum because of their social background, which uh, uh, perhaps doesn't give them the taste or the freedom to come to a museum because they think that it's it, it's not for them. So once you've... Uh, remove the uh, barrier of the physical doorway to the museum, are we uh, reaching a new audience? I think that we, we don't know. I understand that's what people are saying. We don't have the answer to this question, but I think that these uh, lessons are very important for us to learn in the, the months and, and years to come. I don't know what uh, you think, those of you who've Who've, who've said a bit less might want to just uh, make a few final comments. We've got a, a couple of a couple of minutes uh, left uh, before we wrap up. The, the the question which goes along with that is actually is the reverse not happening? Is the digital divide creating uh, a new? Uh, a set of people who are excluded from culture and museums. Obviously, we're not going to be able to answer that question uh, this afternoon. Uh, we can probably just say that it's a, a question we need to think about uh, together. 
because we uh, need to be thinking about museums and the future, uh, that probably shows us what kind of questions we need to work together on. Does anyone uh, want to respond? Yes, I would like to say uh, another thing. It's Marie-Laure here. I think it uh, raises questions about the concept of the audience. Uh, uh, in the past, we knew who, who was the audience. They came to the museum, they came into our four walls. But today, who are our audience? I think that's a much more complicated question. And I think that's a question we need to think much more broadly about the question of audience or audiences. There might be different types of audiences as well, very varied audiences. So I think we need to redefine the idea of audience for a museum. I think that's going to be something we'll be forced to do. Yes, thank you, Mary Law. I see someone uh, in the chat whose name is Laure uh, P, who is asking a question. Uh, a very important question. Uh, this question is, uh, is there any sign of uh, a, a, ver a variation uh, in your audience? It, it's Laure Pesek who's asking this question. Uh, are there any sense of new uh, interest uh, among different audiences for museums? It's a very good question. Has have there been a renewal? Uh, has there been a renewal in this period? Right from the outset, we said to ourselves, the museum of the future should not be like the museums of the past. When we were saying that, I think we all were really hoping that museums of the future would be more accessible. Um, a bit less elitist, if uh, we could say it like that. This is a, a question that uh, came to us straight away. The other uh, question that came up very quickly was how we could move away from museums uh, that uh, are unsustainable. Uh, all of these objects that have to be transported around generating carbon emissions, that was that was another whole question uh, that was around for us. But uh, this question of broadening access and accessibility uh, to museums came to us uh, very quickly and probably in the first fortnight of the, the the pandemic. And I think we probably now uh, need to show the politicians and our audience that we uh, are able to address this question. There's somebody who would like to, to speak? Yes, uh, I would like to speak. Huawei uh, P10, uh, if you'd like to uh, speak to us. I would like Perhaps to introduce speak. Yourself. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we hear you clearly. Uh, do right. introduce yourself. I, I, I am Gemma Cruz Araneta from Manila, Philippines. Well, our museums, the National Museum of Fine Arts, the National Museum of Anthropology and Natural History, and all the field museums all over the country don't charge entrance anymore. And we found out that that is the only way to attract a lot of people from all walks of life. Most of the people who go to the museums, well, this was before the pandemic. Most of the people who go to museums are students, young students, you know, Manila is the university city. So they hang around the museum in droves. They have to line up to enter because there's so many of them. And during weekends, families come, grand parents, uh, grandchildren, families come and they just go around all the museums. But um, this did not happen when we used to charge entrance. Now the museums are under the executive branch of the government and uh, it has been receiving a good funding from the government. 
Before we suspended the entrance fees, we had to ask our commission on audits. And we told them that, look, with the entrance fee of 100 pesos, uh, that's about uh, $2, uh, nobody comes to the museum or very few people come to the museum. So what's the point? So they allowed us to suspend the entrance fees. So now the museum is a destination. It's filled up. It's full of people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to our dear uh, Filipino colleague for this uh, very relevant uh, comment. Many museums around the world have decided to uh, to reopen uh, free of charge in order to uh, allow uh, audiences uh, to come back and enjoy the things they'd missed for many months. We all know in France, so we understand this uh, very well. Uh, museums that are free of charge make a big change to the structure of the audience. I, yes. I'm afraid that we're going to have to stop there. It's uh, 2.30, it's past 2.30 already. I know that a number of you have other meetings that are going to be starting. We've spent a good amount of time together. Thank you very much uh, to all of you. You've been uh, uh, very loyal uh, listeners, around 80 people uh, in the meeting, between 75 and 80 in any case. And I don't know who it was that mentioned earlier on who was talking about foreign audiences. Uh, Tanya, I think, was talking about uh, foreign visitors to the media meeting. I know that's not exactly this, this, the subject of today's uh, discussion, but our uh, debates and discussions that we've been holding uh, on Zoom and on Teams during this meeting, uh, one of the effects of, uh, of organizing all of these meetings uh, has very clearly been to uh, enable uh, museum processionals from around the world, from the whole world, to come together on these uh, meetings. I think 30% or so of our participants today uh, come from uh, countries other than France, uh, all around the world. And that's uh, been a, a real habit uh, when we have physical uh, re meetings. That wasn't uh, our uh, usual audience certainly not within ICOM uh, France. Obviously, there are uh, some museums who uh, have very extensive tourist visitors, but that's not the reality for many uh, museums. Uh, uh, it's certainly not representative uh, of, of museums. I'm thinking of a museum like uh, Louvre, which gets a lot of tourists. Let me take this opportunity to, to, to greet everyone. If anyone wants to add anything else in the, the chat, uh, from tomorrow onwards on our YouTube channel, uh, the recording will be available. We will uh, write uh, brief uh, proceedings of the meeting and publish them in autumn. I think these discussions are ever increasingly spontaneous and interesting and you are uh, uh, there are very many of you who are coming in to share your experiences and uh, respond to our invitation it's a very uh, precious thing so our next meeting will be on the 7th of September we've cancelled the uh, meeting in August because a lot of museums uh, in our part of the world, uh, in the Northern Hemisphere said that, uh, they said everyone's gonna be on holiday, so there's no point us getting uh, together. I'm sorry to any of you who don't have uh, holidays in the July, August period, you won't be able to connect with our debates, but we'll be back uh, again in September. And on the 7th of September, we will be talking about the worldwide territory We'll be talking about the way this period has connected us together, uh, as I was just saying a moment ago, uh, uh, all around the world, uh, the physical uh, barriers have uh, fallen away uh, uh, just uh, in the way that we've uh, been able to come together today. Thank you to all our speakers. Thank you to all of our participants. It's been great to hear uh, your uh, uh, testimonies. 
thank you to Philip, John, Teresa, and to Didier, our interpre interpreters, uh, who've been able to, to listen to us uh, around around the world. <laughs> Uh, Juliet uh, nearly forgot John, but I had remembered him. Uh, this is one of our trademarks. Uh, to, we decided uh, that all of our debates and discussions, even the very spontaneous ones like these, would be interpreted to enable people to uh, take part from all the way around the world. Uh, ICON members and museum professionals, wherever you are, we felt that this was our responsibility to make this effort so that we could enable all members to access the uh, information uh, information from uh, important speakers like we've heard today we don't want to keep it to ourselves just keep it to a few people we need to uh, make it available to as many icon members as possible uh, so it's shared even if you haven't been able to be there. Thank you to our interpreters again. Thank you to each one of you. Uh, we'll be back again on the 7th of September. Uh, we've got uh, another professional conference on the 24th of September. Uh, what cultural policy do museums need? There'll be a lot of uh, interesting speaker. We're going to have the French uh, Minister of Culture who's going to uh, answer some of the questions that uh, uh, are being asked. Uh, UNESCO will be there, ICOM International will be there, I think the European Union should be representative and the question uh, that is, is asked is a very relevant one. What cultural policy do we need? Obviously we all need money but money is not the only thing we need. We also need policy. We need uh, meaning behind our action. That's the question that we're going to raise and I do hope uh, ICOM colleagues that very many of you will join us on this uh, uh, platform. It will be a physical meeting, but it will also be on a digital uh, platform and will help you. Hope you'll be able to connect. Have a great day and thank you, each one of you.